So then, without further ado, then uh, Javi Altafach will uh, start today. Javi has, is located in Barcelona, has been involved from very early on um, with the association, with the fundamental basic research into some of the early uh, identified mutations and, and has helped us a, a great deal uh, to move everything ahead and explaining uh, the background of, of the green mutation, its clinical manifestations, etc., to all the parents uh, involved. He's a professor at uh, the University of Barcelona and um, is a part of the Barcelona Green Team uh, group as well. So thank you very much, Xavi. I know you're going to give a, a beautiful overview today. And uh, we will get started with you. I just want to also introduce Mireille Oliveira because we're going to go smoothly from one speaker to the next. Um, Mireya, we know from our own independent research work in, in other fields and I had the luck to get her involved into GRIN and, and she is a professor in bioinformatics, the best structural chemist I've ever met and she is really the, the brain behind those structures that you're going to see that tell us so much about the potential impact of mutations on the function of, of the NMDA receptors. Uh, professor at the University of Vic in Central Catalonia and also a, a team member of the Barcelona Green uh, group. So thank you both of you and uh, please Javi, I'll pass it over to you then. Okay, so thank you very much Christine for this kind uh, introduction of Mireia and myself. So I'm going to proceed uh, to share my, my screen and if everything is fine, and you can see in the whole screen the presentation. I'm going to, to move forward. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, especially the, the organizing committee uh, for, for preparing this uh, wonderful uh, scientific uh, program for today's session. Um, thank you, especially uh, Sandra, Mel, and Marita, but also all the people from the uh, Green to Be Europe for organizing this uh, meeting, uh, this uh, virtual or remote uh, meeting that at least uh, can provide you the new uh, results and, and data that uh, have been obtained by several groups uh, along the, the, the last year. Uh, I think that. Um, that green community is growing, not only in terms of families, but also the associations are, are, are growing up. Uh, and also research uh, and, and, and research networks are being formed. So uh, this is the, the most uh, promising uh, aspect, uh, I mean, from, from the last year that uh, people and, and researchers and families are pushing up uh, research and, and transnational studies. So for today, uh, I try to, to, to give you an overview on, on what, what is an NDA receptor, but uh, at the same time, I, I try to, to avoid being too redundant with uh, previous presentations. For those of you that already attended my, my talks in, in, in the first and second uh, um, uh, days of, 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 of the conference, uh, I, I completely uh, changed, well, not fully, but almost the presentation. And I wanted to, to give a, a, a view, uh, probably more integrative, uh, since uh, I think that uh, the field of NNDA receptors and green related disorders is really uh, focusing on brain uh, phenotypes. But I think that, and, and you, the families, you, you, you are very aware of that, that. Uh, green related disorders goes uh, beyond what, it, what are the, the, the neuronal phenotypes. And please let me uh, go to the, to the origins, or not the origins, but at least uh, ancient times. This is a, a draw from uh, Leonardo da Vinci. This is the Vitruvian uh, man. And I, I wanted to start the talk by presenting this, uh, uh, this image, this illustration that uh, somehow shows that the proportions in a body are, are really, can, they can feed this circle, meaning that uh, this is something that is, uh, this is like the geometrical shape of the perfection. And also uh, this really, at least for me, it gives me this uh, view that uh, all the systems 
in a human body are closely uh, connected. Uh, so uh, I think this is very, very important, not only uh, in, 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 in health, but also in adrenal-related disorders. So we need to, to go uh, beyond uh, what is just the brain phenotypes and, and, and try to, to connect what are the, the GI tract uh, phenotypes, what are the motor alterations that can result from NNDA receptors um, uh, dysfunctions. So uh, from this uh, very initial uh, cartoon and, and view of, of what is a man uh, or a woman, of course, uh, and along with the centuries, the technological developments have uh, provided uh, very valuable uh, tools to understand and, and, and to go in, in very much detail on what is really uh, happening and, 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 and what is health and what are the disease conditions. So uh, this, this uh, zooming in uh, has been achieved by many, many technological developments. In the right part of the, of, of the slide, you can see a human, so this is uh, a length dimension, okay? So you, you see that uh, a man is uh, it's in between one, two meters, hey? And if, if we go uh, more in detail and, and we use microscopy, uh, we can have different uh, images or, or, or different, uh, we can have different levels of study. What is really inside man? So we have the, the, the systems, liver, brain, heart, but then we have uh, the basic unit of, of human beings that are the, the cells, okay? And even uh, more in detail, uh, cells are composed by several, uh, well, by a complex machinery that uh, is represented here, such as uh, mitochondria, okay, and there is endoplastic, endoplasmic reticulum, plasma membrane, the nucleus, and, and if we go even more in detail, there is DNA. So uh, currently, we have a lot of information on DNA, and this is what we obtain, or families uh, have, when they have the, the genetic report. But then, uh, what is difficult is, 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 to, is to understand how DNA will determine what is happening in a human being. And in the context of green-related disorders, how DNA uh, variants can trigger uh, some neurological conditions and systemic conditions, as in green-related disorders. So brain uh, is a very, very uh, complex uh, system that uh, somehow is, is using electricity to connect millions of, of neurons, millions of cells among them. And, and, and this structure is really uh, powerful and is controlling most of, of or, or, or at least or almost all the, the, the systems of a human body. So brain is not, is not only involved in, in, in what we call the, 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 the neuronal phenotypes that can be represented by these emojis, so the motions, communications, and cognitions, of course, they are uh, uh, closely related with, with brain function, but also senses. So senses are uh, allowing us to communicate and, and, and to have this adaptation to environmental uh, stimuli. Uh, so senses are necessary well, to, to have vision, to hear properly, for smelling, taste, and touch. And brain is integrating the senses, uh, sensorial information and to providing uh, uh, an adapted response. But also brain is important in, in the sleep pattern and also controls the immune system. So whenever there is a, a brain alteration, there is, since the brain is like the, the master commander of the human body, then sleep patterns can be altered. This is something that will be visited by uh, uh, Dr. Garcia Cazorla. And, and sleep pattern is also uh, one of the, of, the, of the phenotypes that are uh, affected uh, by in, in green-related disorders. Further, uh, immune system is also modulated. There is a cross uh, talk between immune system and brain. And brain also is uh, important for the control of movements and the gastrointestinal function. So there is a very close relationship between gut and brain. And this is a bidirectional connection. So uh, from this uh, initial and central picture of the brain, 
you, what you can see here in the upper left uh, part of the slide is this connectivity, these pathways. These are like uh, highways that connect brain with uh, the, the different organs of the body. This complex circuitry was already uh, described and this is uh, a real uh, illustration by Santiago Ramon y Cajal, a Spanish neuroscientist, that uh, defined, that, that drew uh, this uh, neuronal, this, uh, and this neuronal uh, network and, 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 and this uh, connectivity that you can hear, uh, uh, you can hear, uh, see here. So he called these structures uh, the, the butterflies of the soul uh, because of their uh, butterfly shape and, and, and their the beauty as well. And one important thing that you can see here is that uh, these neurons, you can see uh, this central part, which is, uh, corresponds to the soma, including the nucleus and the DNA, but all these thin uh, processes here, which are called dendrites, are indeed creating a, a very uh, complex network. So they, they, they are like a, a, a spider net that are connecting uh, thousands of neurons amongst them. And the context, the very thin context, uh, indeed, uh, correspond to this uh, particular structure, which is called the synapse. So a synapse is a part of the neuron, or of two neurons that are very close one to each other. And uh, this, al this allows uh, a, a cross-talk. So when, when, when one termination of neuron one, such as here, uh, has a, a, a stimulation, it will release what is called a neurotransmitter. A neurotransmitter is a chemical compound that is released. So it's like sending a message from neuron one. And then neuron two, that is very close, can sense this uh, neurotransmitter and, and, and upon this, this uh, release of the neurotransmitter, uh, the receptors that are in neuron two will catch the neurotransmitter and they will somehow understand that they must be activated. This is important in the context of NMDA receptors, of course. So uh, here you can observe uh, the neuron one that is releasing uh, the neurotransmitter at this level, the synapse, and then is passing the information, okay? So this is a flux of information with, between synapses. So specifically, and now we're focusing on NMDA receptors. NMDA receptors, as you know, uh, they are uh, receptors for a neurotransmitter, which is glutamate, and NMDA receptors are very complex proteins that are able to sense glutamate. They are composed by different, what we call subunits, different proteins. Some of them are GLU N1, GLU N2B, and these proteins result from, uh, 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 are the gene products of green genes. So in other words, in, in, in our cells, we have uh, DNA. This DNA has uh, thousands of, of, of genes and, and some of these genes are uh, green genes. Green genes, they are transformed into proteins and uh, these proteins build up NMDA receptors. But what are really doing NMDA receptors in these synapses, in these neurons? So here you can see that when glutamate is uh, released in the synapse, this allows an opening of these NMDA receptors. Somehow this is, uh, like a, a, a door that is being opened. And when this door is opened, this allows calcium influx. Calcium goes into the neuron too. And this calcium is really very, very, very important for neuronal physiology, okay? So this calcium is like a, 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 a green signal, a, a green light that uh, may allow the, the neuron to respond. Okay, so, but this is what we call under physiological or standard or normal conditions. But what is happening when there is a variant, a mutation in, in these green genes? The, the different mutations are roughly classified into two main uh, types. We call the first type the gain of function, okay? Gain of function meaning that they have an additional function. 
But in, 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 in that case, again, it's not something, it's not a quality, okay? It's not, it's not uh, an asset. Uh, it means that this gain of function indeed uh, corresponds to an additional function, and then uh, this can have a, 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 a negative effect on NMDA receptors. So let's see in, in this cartoon what is happening when there is a, a gain of function variant. Please remember that uh, when there is in the normal conditions, okay, there is this influx of calcium. This influx of calcium is regulated. Here we represent it by two uh, calcium ions, two uh, green uh, balls that are going inside. But in gain of function variants, in addition to this normal calcium influx, there is an additional calcium influx. This is in red, okay? There is too much calcium that is going inside. And too much calcium means that something will go wrong. There is a second type, a second classification of green variants. And these are called the loss of function, meaning that they have less activation, okay? So in that case, we have, in comparison to the, to the normal NMDA receptor, loss of function green variants, they lead to a reduced calcium influx. There is not enough calcium uh, going through these receptors when they are activated. So, uh, to, to, with, the, uh, with an analogy to a river, uh, this in, in the left part, you will see the receptor that is opening a door, or, or yes, and then is allowing this uh, influx of calcium, or in that case of the river, uh, an, a normal uh, rate or, or flow rate of water. In gain of function, there is too much water that is uh, flowing, and then and this can be uh, a well, can be negative. In the contrary, for these green variants that result in loss of function, there is not enough uh, water flow. So in both conditions, it is really important, uh, and, and when there is a green variant, is critical is, is very important to determine whether this green variant, a specific green variant, sorry, will result in either a gain of function or a loss of function. This is the initial and, and, and what we call the functional annotation of green variants. And is really important because uh, in terms of therapies, what we and, and others will try is to normalize, okay, to, to, to give uh, these receptors that are either gain of function or loss of function to reestablish normal flow rate of calcium. So the first and, and, and most critical part is to determine uh, uh, after the genetic diagnosis whether uh, a specific green variant uh, leads to a gain or to a loss of function. So this is a summary table uh, from this uh, initial part of the talk. Uh, we have a, an, in normal conditions here in, in green, uh, we have a green gene that, uh, and that is, uh, results in a gluon protein or an NMDA receptors that is, uh, allows this calcium influx, and this is important for neurotransmission and brain function and all the, the systems control, okay? This is under uh, what we call physiological conditions. In the presence of a green genetic variant that is uh, pathogenic and, and can result in a loss of function or a gain of function, there is an alteration of gluon protein that results in NMDA receptor dysfunction and neurotransmission and brain functions are altered. So the difficulty of, of green-related disorders is that from a few green genes, there is a, a, a multiple uh, elements, multiple DNA elements that can be affected, okay? But, uh, and, and this is something that Mireya will illustrate in the next talk. And at the end, uh, this results in a very uh, diverse clinical spectrum that uh, Angels Garcia Cazorla will show you in the third talk. So, um, our, our pipeline, and, 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 and this is also something that is being um, used uh, and, and followed by, by most of the, of the groups working on green-related disorders, is that from a genetic diagnosis, 
families or clinicians are contacting uh, people that is performing this functional annotation. In the Barcelona Green Cluster, uh, we perform uh, these annotations using in silico or computational studies. These are led by Mireia Olivella and also in vitro studies. We, we record the currents and, and, and we uh, study what is happening when these variants are expressed in, in cellular models. This allows to classify these green variants into gain or loss of function variants. And this is really important uh, to, to, for decision making of precision medicine. So we are especially interested uh, to evaluate new therapeutic strategies that can rescue either gain of function variants by attenuating them, their activity, and a loss of function variants uh, uh, through the enhancement of, of, of NMDA receptors. So overall, uh, this is like a, a, an inverted pyramid in which from many, many green variants at the end, we want to focus and to, and, 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 and to, and to define uh, which treatment will be the most optimal for each individual case. So uh, once the families or clinicians uh, have the, the genetic report, in the genetic report, uh, basically, it will give a, 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 miles, a, a milestone uh, on, on which uh, part of the DNA and, and which nucleotide uh, is affected. This information is uh, somehow uh, difficult to interpret, uh, in interpret by families, but uh, this is the most important information uh, if we wonder to, 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 to start the functional annotation. So from this uh, the in genetic report, you can contact uh, uh, our team or others and, uh, and requ uh, request a functional analysis. So the second, uh, once you contact uh, the functional analysis uh, uh, laboratories, uh, it is important to provide the genetic report, also to establish physician's contact, okay, because they will be uh, also the, 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 um, the relay between uh, you and, 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 and researchers and phys physicians. Also very important to provide an informed concern uh, signature and then with all these documents uh, the, the laboratories can start the functional annotations and uh, after uh, de depending depending if, if this variant is annotated or not uh, the time to deliver the functional report uh, will vary so this functional report will uh, at the end be uh, uh, sent to the to the physician that is following uh, green children and uh, clinical decisions will be uh, adapt, adopted uh, based on the functional reports. So we currently have about uh, more than 150 cases uh, and families and, and clinicians that contacted us and we uh, started to perform most of, of these uh, uh, functional annotations. The distribution, at least this is for Barcelona uh, Green Cluster, okay? And, and most of them are from, uh, from Europe, about uh, more than 100 are from Europe, but uh, recently we have all also uh, been contacted by uh, several clinicians from South America and also from uh, the States, uh, Canada, and, and, and many other countries. So uh, once we have this genetic report that is provided by families or by clinicians, then we, we uh, start uh, a first set of uh, computational studies, which uh, will be presented by Mireya. And also, well, well, if, if, the, if the green variant is not already uh, reported, uh, we start, we undergo the functional annotations of green variants. So to, uh, this is uh, the, the work that we are doing in our laboratory. I would like uh, to, to mention the work of Ana Santos, who is uh, here and who is doing an amazing uh, work in, in, in cloning and, and expression and, and functional annotation of these variants. So uh, she's a, a brilliant PhD in my lab and she's a, a really hard worker, very organized, and, and she's, uh, she has uh, already 
uh, annotated more than uh, 50 uh, different uh, uh, green variants. But also, I wanted to acknowledge, uh, especially uh, Fede Miguez, a PhD student, and uh, David Soto, who are uh, also uh, the masters of uh, electrophysiology. So uh, this is a, a very time-consuming uh, task. Okay, so uh, we need a uh, few days uh, or even few weeks for uh, each individual variant to be uh, properly annotated. And uh, what we do normally is, is, to, is to express, so to, to create uh, the, the green variant of interest, to express in cellular models, to see if this variant uh, goes to the membrane or is expressed in the synapses. And then uh, we move to the, to the electrophysiology. So basically we measure how these receptors, how these NMDA receptors uh, uh, doors, let's uh, say, yeah, and uh, how they can be activated and, and if they are a, a gain or a loss of function. So recently, uh, I would like to, I'm, I'm happy to, to show you this uh, slide, the, the next two slides, in which uh, we, um, a part of these annotations have been recently, uh, um, the, have been uh, the object of a, of a manuscript that has been recently accepted for publication. And, and this one consisted in the annotation of a particular uh, set of green variants that indeed uh, is what we call the truncations, okay? So these green variants, as you can see here in, in the, at the bottom, uh, the green ones here, okay? Uh, these truncations result in shorter uh, NMDA receptor subunits, okay? So it's like the, the protein is cut and it's not uh, in integral. And uh, what we observe is that uh, most of these uh, truncations affecting gluen2A and gluen2B, so or, or green2A and green2B genes, indeed, uh, they are disease-associated while those affecting green 1, 2D, 3A, and 3D are mostly uh, non-pathogenic, okay? So when, and in other words, when there is one copy of a green 2B or a green 2A gene that is uh, cut, this will lead to, to, to uh, um, a, a pathogenesis. We then characterized using these electrophysiology recordings or uh, cellular experiments. And what we observe is that all these uh, truncations, indeed, uh, they correspond to a loss of function variants. And this is pretty important because uh, uh, nowadays, uh, more than uh, 100 uh, different mutations, tr uh, truncations, have been described. And this means that with this study, we can already address more than 100 uh, green variants and provide this uh, stratification for all of them. So once we have this uh, functional annotation, as I mentioned before, the next step is to try to develop uh, uh, precision medicines. So I'm gonna focus on a particular type of uh, approaches that we, we have developed along the, the last years. And the rationale is that if we have an NMDA receptor that uh, is somehow hypofunctional, meaning that it doesn't work that much as it should do, and what we want to do is to boost this NMDA receptor that is a loss of function, okay? The, it, it is working uh, not enough. So we want to, to push them. To, to put some gas to the to the to the engine and to accelerate and to somehow compensate this uh, hypofunctionality, and this is something that we achieved by means of using uh, this serine in, in in vitro and in in in, in individuals by providing L serine into the diet. So by several uh, experiments, uh, we first uh, our, our pipeline is to initially start with what we call the preclinical studies. We go to the laboratory and we evaluate whether this uh, therapeutic strategy is working in vitro, okay? So we first validate that this is uh, working and this is something that we published last year. And then uh, with these results in hand, we contact the clinicians 
and uh, we consider if we can uh, uh, translate these findings to the clinical practice. So with the proof of concept studies, uh, currently uh, we are uh, well, together with uh, the physicians from San Juan de Deo, and Dr. Garcia Cazorla and, and Natalia Julia. Uh, we started a clinical trial with Alserin that will be presented by Natalia uh, uh, Julia. And we also are exploring two additional uh, compounds called CAT 23 uh, for loss of function and ERC 12 for gain of function. So uh, we, we don't want to, to just uh, fix on alserine, but uh, some other strategies are currently in process. It is important also uh, uh, to, to, to note that these compounds are all of them uh, approved by the FDA or by the European Medical uh, Medicament Agency, meaning that uh, they are uh, very, uh, quickly trans, uh, translatable to the, to the clinical practice. So uh, I think that this was what I wanted to, to give you as the overview of NMDA receptors. Uh, I just want to fix some uh, ideas and, 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 and to, to, to tell you that uh, we must understand NMDA receptors uh, besides this stratification. I think that one of the next steps will consist in to understand how uh, these brain phenotypes are connected with many other uh, systems in, in, in human body. And I would like to, to end up by acknowledging all the people that has been uh, rowing uh, together uh, to, to reach these goals and, and future uh, goals. Uh, so especially people that uh, we initiated these uh, projects at EDBay but now we recently moved to the University of Barcelona. So uh, I already mentioned Ana Santos, uh, but there is also Silvia Locorice, who's working with uh, uh, new experimental uh, models of green-related disorders, David Soto and Fede Miguel, uh, Mireia Oliveira and Adrian Garcia for all the computational studies, and uh, of course, uh, the invaluable uh, help from San Juan de Deu, Angel Garcia Cazorla, Natalia Julia, and our uh, collaborators in Sao Paulo and in CERN, France. And last, uh, I would uh, really also like to, to acknowledge uh, the funding bodies, especially uh, Precipita. This was an action that was uh, uh, performed last uh, two years ago and that allowed to. Uh, to, 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 to provide the fundings for the annotations of up to 30 uh, green variants. Also the Spanish Green Patias Association uh, and also the individual donations that have been really important uh, to achieve uh, the, the green database and these studies on the truncations. And very importantly, I, I, I really, and on behalf of our team, we want to acknowledge all the people, all the families that are really supporting us, and you are the real driving force of all our research. Thank you very much, and I hope that next year we will have a, a physical a meeting and we will, we will really uh, share our time together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavi. That was a fantastic overview and presentation, as always. Um, I don't want to jump in. We have already gotten a few questions. We will address them after Mireia uh, finishes the first block. So uh, I would like to just give over directly to Mireia. Thanks again, Xavi. Thank you so much. Okay, so are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, we yes? see it. Okay. Okay, so thank you very much to the organizers. I have prepared some slides regarding Green Database, which is a new database that we have created containing genetic, clinical, structural, and functional information on green variants. So this is our DNA, 
our DNA is made of three billion nucleotides long, is made of three billion letters in a four letters alphabet, made of A, T, C, and G. And there are differences in our DNA. There are some letters that are different between us, not many at all, but this difference make a, a difference also in how we look alike to our predisposition to disease. And if we can have, for example, a, an adverse drug reaction. And this is very related, highly related to personalized medicine. And this is because we have been accumulating lots of mutations for thousands and thousands of years, and we are still accumulating mutations. So we are still changing our DNA, and we are still changing the letters of our DNA. Every time that the baby is born, the baby will carry 60, an average of 60 new mutations on the DNA. And these mutations do not come from the DNA of their parents. So we are generating changes in the DNA constantly in every baby that is born. So the DNA is the book that we need with all the instructions for any organism to live. And these instructions will be for the, our whole life. If um, we, would need, if we would like to store all this information on our DNA, we need all these books uh, with, uh, with the DNA. And inside these books, we'll find uh, uh, words and words, uh, well, it's just a single word because it's just uh, with no breaks, with, uh, with uh, just a combination of four letters, A, T, C, and G, and this is called our genome. So we'll need all this book, like all this big bookshelf with all these books to store our DNA. And then behind an individual, you have to imagine that we have this bookshelf and this bookshelf with these books with a sequence, it's unique. If we compare the books from one individual to another, we'll realize that there are some differences in some pages. Not a lot of differences, but there are, lots, there are some differences between one individual to the other. And these differences can be in all one letter. So it can only be one letter that is changed between one individual and the other. If these mutations, if this change in one letter falls in a position that it's not really important to read the instructions uh, of the life, so that to read the DNA, then nothing will happen. The variant, the mutation, will be just neutral. Or maybe it will be related to how we look like but nothing will happen. If the variant, if the mutation falls in a region that it's kind of a little bit important to understand the, to understand the, 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 how the, the instructions of life, then this may be related to a predisposition to disease. And then finally, if the variant is in a, in, a, in a region where it's really, really important to understand the instruction, this can be disease causing. But there will be lots of differences between us and nothing will happen. Why a single change in the DNA can be disease causing? We have this piece of DNA here. And as you can see, a change in one letter of the DNA, just one letter, can be translated into a difference in the shape of the protein. So it can, be, it can make a little difference in the, in the conformation in how the protein works maybe this change will cause that the protein won't be able to fold, to exist. And then if the protein is not able to, to have the proper um, uh, shape or, or even um, fold completely, or just a slight change, this can make that the protein will lose the, how, how, how it works. It will have maybe a loss of function, or maybe the change in the shape of the protein will give like a gain of function. And then if this protein is important, is essential uh, for the cell, then this will be disease causing. Um, the last years, the cost of, um, of, of, of sequencing has dropped so fast. So like uh, it, it, this, this, the, the first human genome, if it, uh, we, we were able to sequence it in, in 2000, and it was really, really expensive, and it took 11 years to sequence the first individual. But then, like 10, um, 10 years ago, the cost of the human genome was around 10,000 euros, and it took a lot of time. But now, the cost of uh, sequencing, of exome sequencing now, it's around um, 900 euros, and it takes just some hours to, 
to, to get the sequence of any individual. So the cost of sequencing and the time of sequencing has dropped so fast, and this is making a big change. Thus, there are lots of sequencing projects uh, around the world. Uh, we are in the era of what we call the big data. We want to understand every difference in our DNA and to compare different individuals around the world to understand the difference between us and how this can be related to disease and how can this be important, uh, for, for example, for personalized medicine. And this represents a huge amount of data. We, this is why we need bioinformatics to store, to analyze, to interpret, to understand all this data. So as the cost of sequencing is dropping so fast, and it's not as expensive and, and time consuming as it was 10 years ago, now um, kids with neurological conditions with tentatonic clinical diagnosis are being sequenced complementary to clinical and biochemical analysis. So um, then we, we get the sequence no, of uh, the DNA, and sometimes we can see differences in their genome, in their DNA. And sometimes these differences in the DNA, in the genome, can be in a green gene. Still, these differences, these changes of one letter, can, can be neutral, so nothing will happen. But sometimes the, these differences in the green gene can be um, disease causing, can be damaging, can make a change in the protein, and then uh, can be related to pathology. So once uh, uh, a clinician, a uh, child neurologist, identifies that there's a difference in, a, uh, in one letter of, of so many letters in a green gene, it's important to be to really sure that this, is the, this difference is the one that is related to the neurological condition. So to make sure that it's not a neutral uh, mutation, a neutral variant. And then once we know, or once we are sure that this is uh, damaging, is disease causing, then it will also be important to understand why is it disease causing. Is it causing a loss of function? Is it causing a gain of function? in order to go next, no? to move forward no? into the strategic therapy. So this last year, we have been contacted by more than 150 families. I think that we are around 180 families right now, indeed from families, but also from Green Families Associations, for well worldwide child neurologists, and from child neurologists from the European Consortium. And the requests were uh, about a, a variant, a mutation identified in a child with a neurological condition. And the requests were, were asking to classify these variants are, are really disease causing or not. And then if the variant was disease causing, to ask, and they ask us uh, if it was a loss of function or a gain of function. Before carrying the experiments uh, in Chavi's lab to check if it's a, it was a gain of function or loss of function, we first need to explore if this mutation has been, if this variant has been described before, because there's a lot of information regarding green variants. So first we need to check all the available information. So some years ago what happened was that um, we, when trying to explore all databases and all the information in these uh, green databases and some non-specific green databases, in terms of pathogenesis and functional annotation, we realized that all the information were split in several databases and also in the scientific literature. So it's like having all these books with all the genetic information and also experimental information split you know, around the world in different files in different countries. And in addition, when comparing the information from different databases, we realized that the information was not exactly the, the same. So we, we have done some variants that were classified in a different way depending on the database. And uh, information was growing so fast and there were mutation variants and variants, no more variants each day. So at the end, it was not easy to check for all the information um, before carrying the experiments. So this is why we decided to construct a new database. Uh, the aim was to construct a unified and curated with the, all the information integrated green database containing all green variants. We spent uh, like weeks, I think that month, curating the information entry by entry, 
extracting all the information from the scientific literature. And well, this database was created by Adrian Garcia. He's a PhD student. And, and, and it was possible because of the collaboration of all green families and the financial support that we received from the Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, Green Association. And we have been using this database uh, for more than one year uh, in order to give answer to, this, to, 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 the, to the request from uh, different child's neurologists. The idea is that we have in easy in, in, in just some seconds to be able to display all information that we have on a variant. So we can give a quick answer to the child neurology regarding the pathogenesis and also to the functional notation of a variant. Right now, we have a total number of variants, which is uh, 4,473 variants on green genes. Most of these variants are on green 1, green 2A, and green 2B genes. But from these 4,473 variants, we only have 444 variants that are um, disease causing, that are damaging. The, the, but there are three different, looking at these um, pathogenic variants, these disease causing variants, we have three different scenarios. For some of these variants, the variant is fully annotated, so we can give an answer like, uh, yes, it's a loss of function or it's a gain of function just in second, just in the time that takes us to answer an email. We can tell um, the, the clinicians that the variant is partially annotated, so for certain experiments are required, and sometimes the variant is not annotated. So let me show you how the database works. Sorry that I... I will move this down. Okay, so we just introduced something that it's, it can be easily found in any, any genetic report. So we have the name of the gene, then the position, and then the, um, the amino acid that is mutated. So we introduce just the, the name of the gene, the, the position, and the residue, something like this that can be easily found in any, in any genetic report. And then in seconds, we, we just obtain this answer, which is all the information integrated from different databases. For example, in here we have that this variant has been described in CISFER, in Green Leipzig, in Barcelona Green, and in Love D. So this variant has been described uh, in these four databases. And then we have information regarding on all the experiments and where, where these experiments were, in, in, in the, these experiments were uh, performing two different labs in CIFER and in Barcelona Green uh, Team. Then we have a clinical descriptions, also integrating information in this case from CIFER, from Green Leipzig, and from Barcelona Green. And at the end of integrating all the information, especially the experimental information, we can conclude that yes, this mutation is, this variant is disease causing, uh, is disease associated, and this variant is a loss of function. But sometimes we, we just introduce a mutation and then we realize that it's, uh, it's predicted as a gain of function and the, as the functional information is not conclusive. Then I just called Xavi and asked please to, to do some um, complementary experiment just to be sure that this variant is really a gain of function. And sometimes we introduce a mutation and we realize that there's no information that this variant has been described in patients with a neurological condition, but there's no functional information. And then we have to start from the beginning, trying you know, to annotate this variant. This can take some weeks. And sometimes uh, it happens that we receive uh, the, the variant, the green to be, the position and the change. And, but when we run the database, then we realize that this variant is found in in population with a high allele frequency and that this variant is neutral, is not related to disease. And this is really important to, to tell the, the, the child neurologists this, that this variant is not the disease causing and then that the neurological condition might be related to another gene. And then it's important to keep on looking for the, for the cause, for, for the diagnosis. Okay, so now let me move to the structure. As I'm a, I am a structural bioinformatics, uh, and, and well, I, I look a lot to the structure. I think that they are really important to look at the important to understand what's happening. 
this is the NMDR receptor, and this is uh, the extracellular region. This is the ligand binding um, domain. I'm sorry. And down here we have down here we have the transmembrane domain. So when we receive uh, a variant, we also look inside of we look to the structure of the protein to try to understand what's going on, why this variant is making this change in the shape of the protein that at the end will be related to the clinical, to the neurological condition. So when we receive the request, we, we, we always make a molecular modeling, trying to understand the position, the changes of the residues, and how these changes uh, are, are making a new shape, are making new interactions inside of the protein, and then we um, integrate these with the experimental results, results from our lab or from other labs and to the corresponding clinical phenotype, if it's mild, if it's severe, and well, and to different things, to give a, a unique and integrated view from the structural to the, uh, to the genetics, to the functional annotations, no? everything should be integrated and we have a, no, a view of what's going on. Going on. Every time that we receive a request, we, we collect the information regarding the clinical phenotype of, of the child and the genetic information, and we enrich our database with the results from the experiments uh, in Chadi's lab. And by integrating this information of more than 4,000 variants, uh, we have been able to kind of uh, a little, understand a little bit more the defect of this variant on green genes. Here we have a plot in green are neutral variants on green genes. As you can see, there are more neutral variants than pathogenic or disease causing or disease associated variants. And in red, we have these disease associated variants. So we can see that there are some regions in the NMDA receptor in the green genes um, that if we change, nothing happens. So if we if we just change the letters of the DNA that will result in a change in the amino acids in the region, nothing will happen. And also nothing will happen usually in the intracellular region. But if we just touch a little bit uh, the regions around the ligand binding domain or the transmembrane region, these regions are sensitive. So it's the regions in these books uh, with the DNA that are essential to, to read the instructions uh, to, to just to live. And, and then these regions are really high, highly sensitive, are really essential. And then if there are some changes here, then the, the disease, disease causing. Also, we have been able to map uh, the, the, to classify the, the variants as loss of function and gain of function and to map them on the sequence and to map them on the structure and realizing that there are, there are some regions that are more related to gain of function and some regions that are more related to loss of function. And well, this is, helps us a lot to understand what's going on and to make sense when we, um, when we um, look at the results of the experiments. You know, why is it the loss of function or the gain of function? Will be highly dependent on the region on the NMD receptor. And also, and this is important too, we have been able by collecting information from the clinical phenotypes of the patients and of all the information in the scientific literature and in different databases, we have been able to see some differences in the clinical phenotype between uh, green 1, green 2A, and green 2B. So there are important differences, and also there are important differences, in, especially in green 2B, for example, and also some differences in green 2A and in green 1, uh, for loss of function or gain of function. So the clinical phenotype seems that there might be important differences that will be subunit dependent, so gene dependent, and also gain of function or loss of function. And this is important because this uh, can help clinicians uh, to, 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 to characterize these uh, green childs and then to make, to see if there's the clinical sim symptoms are in according to the, the different uh, classifications and the different clinical phenotypes related to the uh, green subunits and also to gain of function or loss of function. But uh, right now, this information regarding the clinical phenotypes 
it has a lot of limitations because this information has been collected for lots of years, for this, um, for 10 years maybe, um, but under different criteria. Some are come from child neurologies, some not, uh, some from genetics. So there's a lot, this, this information has some limitations. I think that it's really important, and it's urgent now, that we have a patient registry that is um, collecting the information regarding the clinical phenotype of green kids. But under the same criteria, this will help us a lot to understand the differences in the clinical phenotypes. And this can help then once integrate and analyze and interpreting after interpreting this data to help clinicians with the diagnosis of green kids. Still, we have, exactly, we have 150 green variants for which we don't have any functional annotation. So for these variants, we need to carry experiments from the beginning. And these 150 variants represent hundreds of patients. We don't have um, a, a database uh, of patients. We have a database of variants. So we have to understand that behind each variant, there might be more than 10 patients or 20 patients. So still we have these 150 variants for which we don't know the functional annotation. And it's important because this is the first step to design a strategic therapy. And behind these 150 variants, there will be hundreds of patients with this variant. But this is expensive and it takes a lot of time, but I think that we have to put a big, a big effort in uh, annotating these variants. Okay, so this is the, the green database. The, the aim of this green database is just to give a tool, uh, not to us, to the Persona Green Team, but also to clinicians and child neurologists around the world to quickly and easily uh, check if the variant is a gain of function, loss of function, and if it's disease causing. And also for families to check if the information regarding the variant is uh, in the database or not. So um, Barcelona, um, this project has been uh, done by the Barcelona Green Team. Uh, we have the clinicians, the child neurologists in San Juan de Leu, Angel Garcia Carzorla and Natalia Julia. Here the, we have in the University of Barcelona um, with a, a neurobiologist and the electrophysiologist, Xavier Tafaz, David Soto, Ana Santos and Federico Miguez. And in the University of Vic, um, we have um, Gustavo Pompeu Fabra, the bioinformaticians, Adrian Garcia, and myself. And I would like to give you thank you very much to all our collaborators and partners that have made this, possi this project possible. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, Christian, I don't know if now we have yes. time for questions. Yes. yes, thanks Mireya. Thank you, Mireya. Um, thank you um, very thank much you for your part. presentation. Um, I think we have a few questions on the question and answer board, but I'm sorry, um, we were having a little bit of trouble. So if somebody um, has any questions that for whatever reason cannot ask, it, uh, uh, ask them at the uh, Q&A chat, please put it in the regular chat so we can look at them. Um, I have, um, I'm going to start with maybe the, the easiest question of all, then the other three that are in the chat, it's a they are a little bit more uh, complicated, but uh, uh, I would like to start with a question from one of our attendees, uh, who they actually just wanted to know um, how to, that we come about doing the functional testing if you need blood. Uh, or, um, and the other question together with this was um, if anybody is undergoing any kind of treatment and what are the results? Yes, regarding the functional annotation, uh, we don't need uh, blood samples or, or any kind of, of like samples from, from children. Uh, we just need the genetic report. So uh, normally when you your your the, the genetics uh, unit or department uh, will give you uh, the result from this genetic report with a, a a code number of the gene that is affected and and this milestone so normally there is the position the nucleotide position and the amino acid that is affected so this is uh, the only thing uh, we need uh, for for well to to check in in, in Mireya's database 
uh, if the variant has been already described or, or not, or if, if functional studies uh, need to be performed. Uh, nevertheless, uh, there is this um, informed sign uh, consent that is necessary because since we will uh, have your confidential data, uh, we need uh, your approval uh, that uh, you agree and, 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 and signature that you are agreeing that uh, this information will be kept uh, confidential, of course, anonymous. Uh, but we are able to uh, process this information and, and use it for uh, research uh, goals, okay? So only send this uh, genetic uh, report and the, the same consent form. And regarding the treatments, I think that uh, this will be the object of uh, Angels Garcia Cazorla and, and, and Natalia Julia. So I don't want to spoil the, the talks. But uh, there are, I think that something very important and I want to state is that there are already uh, the first clinical trial that has been initiated in, in Barcelona's Children's Hospital. And this is a, a, a real milestone in, in the field of clinic related disorders. So this is something uh, really amazing that they are performing. And, and this is a, a very important piece of hope for our green children. But, I think that Angels can give you a very <laughs> uh, a lot of details on that. Okay, so Thank you. I, think, I think that there's another question regarding the database, which is how do you make sure that people are not registered in more than one place and therefore possibly being double count, double count, yes. Um, this is a, the database, our database at least, is not a, a list, uh, or it's not a database regard, uh, of patients. It's a database of variants. So behind each variant, there can be several patients. So it doesn't matter. We, we, we usually find that the same patient has been registered in, in, different, uh, in different databases. And this is no problem for us because we are just collecting um, variants. So just the, the list of, of variants, it doesn't matter if it's from one patient or from 10 patients. Uh, and then we just describe if it's pathogenic or not, and if it's a loss of function or a gain of function. So don't be afraid to, to, to give the information so to several databases. But I think that something different is regarding a patient registry. And the patient registry, it's really important that it's a list of patients, and then they will have a, an identifier, and you should make sure that there's no double entry for the same uh, patient. But it, it makes a big difference, a uh, patient registry to a database of uh, green variants. Thank you. There's also uh, three other questions that, that were at the beginning of the list of the Q&A. Um, one of them is, is why the NMDA dysfunction is necessarily leading to loss of function versus or gain of function. Couldn't it be a combination of both? Um, yes. Uh, yes. When, when we try to understand biology and, and what a mutation uh, generates, uh, we are humans and, 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 and we, we have this boxed uh, vision of reality or of biology. So in, in, in our mind or our brains, we try to make uh, like different classifications. So we roughly classify into loss or gain of function. These are the, the main categories, but this is like a, a, a spectrum and a, and a, a gradient. So not all the mutations will be 100% loss of function or 100% gain of function. There is a, a between, a penumbra area where you have some alterations that correspond to gain of function, but the same variant has some other aspects that are from a loss of function. And this is a, like a third category that we call it the complex variants, which are pretty uh, difficult to, to also uh, design uh, therapeutic uh, strategies because they are not that pure as a law of 100% loss or 100% gain of function. But yes, uh, totally uh, I agree that there is this uh, myriad of, of green variants. But for, for the sake of, uh, of, of getting categories, we, we, we classify in, in these two main categories, loss or gain of function. I'm just going to continue with the questions. Um, the next one is regarding um, 
puberty. And if puberty changes uh, what we're seeing in terms of loss of function, because it's been commented uh, some families that um, that the kids seem to improve as they reach puberty and maybe this goes more with a change maybe of the proteins and the connectivity of the brain in terms of the number of uh, for example this is the case of a green to be child um, you know could it be that the green to be changes into a green to a and i don't know if you can comment something about that um, yes, that's an important uh, feedback from families. That uh, is something that we didn't explore yet uh, regarding this um, uh, developmental shift that has been uh, described. I think that Angels has uh, she has been preparing a description of this, but at least uh, the different green uh, genes are expressed at different uh, uh, stages of development. So at the beginning, green one and two B are, are widely expressed, and then green two A starts to expression. As far as I know, uh, during puberty, there is not an additional shift, but uh, probably uh, hormonal control uh, and, and, and cost talk with uh, the brain uh, can have an effect. And, and well, I, I think it's better if uh, a physician and, and, and a child neurologist uh, can give you a, a more appropriate answer. But yes, it makes sense. Yeah, and I think the next question also might be more related to, to uh, for Angels, but because um, again, this is uh, about experience of having some of these kids either have low or high sensitivity to anesthetics, um, and they could be explained by the NMDA receptor. I don't know if you wanna comment or you wanna leave that for Angels. Uh, I think we can leave it for, for angels, yes. Uh, so some kind of anesthetics, uh, they work on also the ketamine-based uh, anesthetics. They, they have an effect directly on NNDA receptors. Uh, but I don't know we, uh, about uh, green children that have been anesthetized. What, what are the responses if they are uh, less prone to or less, more resistant to anesthetics or which kind of anesthetics? Um, and um, okay, so I'll go for the next one. Um, is there a difference uh, regarding research and possible clinical approaches between missense and nonsense variants? Yeah, yeah, or I mean, um, I mean uh, like Chaibi was explaining, I think in his presentation, uh, making nonsense proteins usually. Uh, gives uh, uh, a loss of function protein. While with missense variants, we, we have gain of function or loss of function. Or at least with all variants that we have seen that are nonsense, they at, le at the end result in a, in a loss of function. Mm. Yeah, so what, what is really clear is that uh, this pathogenic uh, green uh, nonsense mutations, they result in a loss of function. And what is interesting, and, and it's something that I skipped from the presentation because of uh, uh, time restrictions, but uh, the phenotypes are milder in, uh, normally. So this is like a general rule, but in general, uh, the, the phenotypes of green children with uh, green uh, nonsense or truncations are milder than those that have missense mutations. So this is somehow like, having less receptors, because at the end, nonsense mutations uh, trigger a, a reduction on NMD receptors. So these children have less receptors, but at least all the receptors they have, they work properly. So it's a matter of number. There is not enough NMD receptors. What is happening in, uh, in the context of missense mutations is that uh, in most of the cases, these mutations, they uh, form already uh, an MDA receptors, but they are misfunctioning. So they, they are interfering with, let's say, normal NMDA receptors, and they have a, 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 more, a, a very uh, a powerful effect, even in the, in, the, in the normal or wild type receptors. So it's like a more severe, this is like a general rule, yes. 
Thank you. And the last one um, of the questions that we have right now, if anybody wants to put something else on the chat, we might have a couple minutes. Um, is, is there a web link uh, for the database that Mireya just, just showed? Yeah, there's a web link. Um, we, are, we are just publishing the, the, the paper and waiting for some answers from the editor. I hope it will be in one week. Uh, it has taken, uh, took us a long, a long time because the database was finished in March and now the process of publishing is being so slow. But once it's published, then it's published that it will be in maximum two weeks. We, of course, with the, the, the link to, to the green community. So it can be used and for families, from child neurologists, from anyone. This is the idea to share it and that this, that this information can be used from, from anyone. So families will be able also to check if, if, the, if the information uh, is in the database. As this database is collecting information from all databases, uh, then just by uh, getting inside the database and introducing the, the protein and the chain, they will realize if it's really in, in, in any of that of our database. And if not, and if they want to, to give the information regarding the variant, they can contact um, Barcelona Green Team. I think that there's the address um, somewhere they can contact in order to request from, for a variant that is not there. And still, while we are waiting from this link, we, we, they can also request and write an email to us to request for any information regarding any that any any variant. 